The first question we have is for you. Um, and the question is about how long on average after surgery uh, do most, uh, can most patients resume eating regular meals? So regular meals, I guess that depends what that means. So you're eating solid food by about three to four weeks. Um, you initially start with a liquid diet uh, that last couple of weeks and then uh, go to a soft food and then regular food after that. But when you first start out, uh, patients do feel like they just get full too quickly and can't you know, eat the volume of food that they would like. And that takes usually another uh, few weeks. Uh, so it takes about six weeks to get to a point where you're eating fairly regular food um, at a volume over the course of the day that allows you to maintain your weight. Usually it takes a couple months from that time to get to the point where you're eating just regular three square meals um, and then you know, maybe snacking in between. Uh, but usually about the sixth week when you're able to maintain your weight is when you get rid of your, when you lose your feeding tube. Um, and beyond that point, uh, you're basically just managing your diet orally. Whether that's be, you may have to take some supplements occasionally here and there in, on the initial part, but again, most people seem to recover uh, after the first few months. And, and I will add to this that um, probably the most common question that I get after esophagectomy is why am I not doing better? Uh, most people expect that they're doing better, should be doing better, and it takes a while for this new anatomy uh, to for you to get used to it. And uh, it takes uh, you have to learn how to change the way you eat, and and uh, and that takes uh, that takes a significant amount of time. And I think the bottom line is that you will get better, and it just takes a while for you to learn how how to be a new new person and deal with your new anatomy. Now I have a, the next question is a very sort of big, big picture question, um, and I think we probably can't answer that question, but I think it's worth talking about. And it says, do you anticipate uh, when there will be a vaccination to, present, uh, to prevent cancer, uh, or specifically esophageal and gastric cancer? Uh, and maybe Adam might be the, the best to, to <clears throat> answer that question. Um, so. Um... I think vaccines to prevent cancer are uh, probably a long way off with a couple exceptions. I mean, the exceptions might be that there are certain cancers that have a clear uh, viral cause, you know, the obvious example being um, uh, the HPV vaccine for human papillomavirus, which is a cause of head and neck and cervical cancer. So in that case, the, the vaccine can clearly um, uh, um, you know, lead to great reduction cancer risk. I'll say um, maybe moving to the therapy side will be this afternoon. Right now there's a lot of research in cancer vaccines as therapy, and the way that those cancer vaccines work is that you're trying to stimulate, as a general rule, you're trying to stimulate the immune system to attack the tumor, and the typical way that those vaccines work is that um, the immune system needs to say that, okay, this is tumor and this is normal. So it has to, you know, you want a vaccine that's an attack of tumor, not to attack your whole body. And one of the way those vaccines work is that they can try to get um, the immune system to attack cells that have the, the, uh, the DNA the mutations that are in the cancer, because that's something that's cancer but not normal. Um, and so there's efforts to make therapeutic vaccines to do that. The problem there is then you are making a vaccine after someone has cancer because you know the cancer has these mutations and therefore we're going to try to get immune cells to attack cells like this. And so that's what there's active research right now at Dana-Farber and other centers to make vaccines like that, but that's when you know what you're trying to vaccinate against. If you think about that in the prevention space, that's challenging because you don't know what, you know, we don't, we don't have a time machine to know what the mutations might be. You know, so then the question is can you, um, you know, find features of very early tumors that are shared across tumors are different from the normal cells and you could vaccinate against. I think that's, that's you know, that would be obviously a, a um, very valuable if we get to there. I think that that is going to be many years off. Yeah. 
Next question is for uh, Carol, our nutritionist. Um, it says, I had heard that um, fish protein is the best protein to eat. Um, is that true, and uh, what type of fish should I be eating? Um, there's many ways to get your protein needs met. Um, fish is definitely not the best. If you're thinking more in terms of the Mediterranean diet, maybe that's where this question's coming from. Um, the Mediterranean diet pattern is definitely probably one of the best, um, quote, diets to follow as far as um, cancer survivorship goes. Um, as far as the best fish to eat, um, most fish have a leaner fat profile, except for the, the fattier fish that have that good, healthy omega-3 fatty acid. So um, I guess here in New England, eat, eat the fish that you like. Um, and then incorporating fatty fish is definitely a positive, like salmon, tuna. Limiting, I usually tell people to limit swordfish to once a month just because the mercury is higher. Um, John, where do you think uh, robotic surgery is going? Uh, how, what are sort of the improvements that, that are going to be made over the next few years? What, how do you see this evolving over the next over Yeah, the next robotics decade? is rapidly changing, actually. The, the newer robot now is much more facile than the one previously, and there are things coming down the pike where um, you can do a very delicate endoluminal surgery um, with uh, machines that uh, you can direct the hand uh, for. And there's also things like single port surgery where you, you know, everything goes through one incision and uh, try to minimize the, uh, the uh, damage around the area. There's also technology for helping identify structures you can't really see. So you can you know, send in markers and highlight areas that you can uh, direct. So um, there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm for where robotics is is heading, except for the fact that it costs a lot. So, you know, cost overlies everything we do in medicine, and, and that's really the one area that's struggling. But from a technological uh, um, standpoint, um, there's things that allow, allow us to do stuff that we really can't do right now in terms of identifying structures, you know, uh, uh, confirming we're getting what we want to get, and we're not leaving anything behind. So this is another big picture question. Uh, so they're all they're asking all the big big questions. How does cancer even start? Um, there are no warning signs. So why do cells go crazy? So maybe uh, I'll let Matt take the first stab at it, and then maybe Adam can chime in. I, I'll give a, as best an answer as I can. I, I mean, I think it's fair to say that at least from a genetic standpoint, from a mutation standpoint, all of us all the time are acquiring mutations as our cells divide and grow and turn over. Um, and there are mechanisms in place within the cells to try to identify those mutations, um, clean them up and repair them. Um, and many of those mutations are of no consequence. Um, Sometimes it's, as best we can understand at least, a matter of chance and, you know, for lack of a better term, bad luck. I mean, you know, I always think that's a little bit of a cop-out. It um, essentially just means we don't understand things very well. Um, but what we do know about cancers, at least the traditional model of how cancers develop from, you know, for example, the normal lining of the stomach, um, you know, you need the right or the wrong, depending on how you look at it, combination of mutations and certain genes probably occurring in a certain order. Um, and it seems like um, almost like an infinitesimally small likelihood that you would get that right or wrong combination, but there's so many cells in the body, there's cells turning over all the time, um, that it's actually not that uncommon to just get the wrong combination of um, mutations. So I think we need to understand, you know, who is being predisposed to these certain abnormalities, whether it's from bacterial infections like H. pylori, whether it's from genetic factors that people inherit diet, lifestyle, or just flat out chance. We also need, I think, technologies to better understand and identify these abnormalities before, you know, we're really just waiting for somebody to get symptomatic, whether it's bleeding, whether it's pain and digestion. How do you find things when they're at that molecular level, intervene and, you know, so-called intercept things before somebody has developed a clinically significant cancer? I think those are the challenges here. It's a lot easier to, to say than to do. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'd say that uh, the way I would think about this is that, um, you know, all of, we have, you know, our cells are made up of, our bodies are made up of trillions of cells, and our bodies 
the cells in our bodies have learned how to become <clears throat> team players. Um, that they, um, you know, um, you know, they're not typically this. They're not out, you know, every cell for itself. They're out. They sort of restrain their behavior to take care of the, the larger person. Um, and you know, and that, you know, evolved because there's various, you know, ways that um, you the cells, the way they act are controlled, like the cells in your brain once you're, you know, an adult, you know, they say we're, just, you know, done, you know, growing, we're, we're not going to, you know, make more brain cells, though, you know, occasionally, I think I could use a few extra brain cells. Um, but, um, um, but, um, um, and so what happens over time is, you know, over time, just through the fact that we're, you know, you know, the, each of these cells has, you know, a DNA that's billions of letters long, and there's just, you know, random process of mutation that happens over time, is that you get changes in a cell, and as that cell gets certain changes, it becomes less of a team player, and then, and also that one cell that has a particular alteration says, I'm going to grow a bit more, and I'm going to get rid of the guys around me instead of then that one cell grows and over a few years then you have you know a million cells that have that gene change and then the chance of their getting you know a second change becomes higher and now those cells with two changes then grow a bit more and they you know are even less of a team player and so that um, uh, happens over time um, and so it's really just evolution that you know if you have gene changes that make you grow better you're going to, over time, there's going to be more of cells like you, and that means more chance of, of um, getting even more changes that, that will happen. So I think, you know, that, you know, so right now we're in an era where we're really trying to understand, you know, what are those early changes in genes that help those cells at the very earliest phases start to grow more so that we're more likely to get cancer. Can we find those things er earlier to find cancers before they have spread? Or can we um, even understand how those early or cells, those early alterations, how they interact with the immune system? Because probably the truth is, you know, there's these things are happening more often than we realize, but they end up in a dead end. And so, um, you know, I think there's a lot we have to learn about the process. But you know, I think it's just a um, um, you know a consequence of you know cells becoming more selfish. And sort of taking off the, you know, the you know the the um, the practices they've ad adopted to allow us to sort of be a living organism, not a place where you know every cell is out for itself. Okay. A follow-up question. Yeah. Follow question In regard to the question you just answered, I'm curious if any panel members are open to other theories about the cause of, the, of cancer related to the damage to the cells, such as adverse complex childhood trauma, psychological trauma that creates severe distress to the cells? Well, I think that's a, that's a very interesting question. So clearly, um, you know, the, um, you know, there's, the body is very complex, and you know psychological <clears throat> trauma can lead to very strong stress responses, very striking impacts on the immune system, and you know it's not um, you know it's not at all surprising to think that um, that those um, uh, those could have uh, impacts on you know enhancing rates of um, mutation or, you know, inhibiting the um, ability of the immune system to clear early mutant cells. I don't know detailed research into, you know, um, into this. I don't know if others know this, but, you know, I think, um, you know, none of that would be at all surprising as well as, um, and I think it's also data that, you know, psychological stress can also lead to you know, certain behaviors, whether it's higher rates of smoking, you know, poor nutrition. I mean, there's so many different um, variables 
um, that could be at play there, whether psychological stress can have more direct effects on the genome. I think there are some theories about that, but I, I, I'm not an expert. In that regard, the research on the causal effect between disease and addiction is outstanding. It's called the ACE study, mm. Adverse Childhood Experiences, which proves scientifically, without a doubt, with thousands and thousands of patients in San Diego. This was done in the, uh, I believe, the um, <clears throat> 80s that yeah. does prove that part. Yeah, no, that makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. The next question is a question that I frequently get, um, but it's actually directed to our nutritionist or dietitian. Um, which, what diet will increase my white blood cells? And I would add platelets as well to that. So patients always want to know what they, can they do, what can they eat to increase uh, their blood counts? There isn't, there isn't one specific food that's going to help your blood counts, um, but overall, if Back to the main thread, if you're getting enough protein, if um, you're getting enough calories and nutrients throughout the day, that's your best chance at keeping your blood can counts up from a nutrition standpoint. Okay. Um, this question may be better answered later on. It says, do results of genetic testing vary over the course of time? Do genetics mutate, or does that cancer mutate? I think we'll leave that for after uh, yeah, lunch. Yeah, we, we will get Adam back. is yeah, going to yeah. specifically address that. Yeah, the, the answer is yes, but yeah. Oh, I would yeah, say, I would I'll at least say from the standpoint of inherited genetics, no. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, at least when we're talking about genetic testing for inherited risk, the genes you're born with are the genes you have, but, it, but yeah, very different when you're talking about genes within a tumor, within a cancer, in the context of treatment. Um, John, um, you made, a, I think, a good case for a minimally invasive esophagectomy, uh, much less side effects, uh, uh, similar outcomes. Um, why isn't everybody getting this? Who, who are the patients who can't get minimally invasive esophagectomies who still have to have open procedures? What are the, what are the requirements? Um, you know, some of it has to, unfortunately, has to do with um, your center and expertise. So uh, there is a bit of a learning curve, and you know, most surgeons being trained coming out now are doing mostly invasive surgery, and and many um, high uh, productive centers have moved over to invasive surgery. But there are places around the country that don't um, do a lot of it. You know, ultimately, the best surgery uh, for cancer um, at one place is the best. Um, surgery that that surgeon can do. And if that's an open procedure, then that's the best option in that setting. But globally, I think uh, if you can uh, go to a place where there's expertise in uh, MIS, it, it would be, in general, uh, to your benefit for a lot of a uh, host of reasons. Uh, but there are very excellent surgeons, um, historically, who are open surgeons who have gotten very good results. Um, and uh, I wouldn't hesitate to refer somebody there if, if, uh, if that's surgeon you wanted. But, um, so there's, there's an equities issue in terms of you know, where it's offered. From a patient characteristic, I think the, as we get along, you know, most patients are uh, candidates. Uh, unless there's issues with tumor and whether what's involved and what it takes to repair those things. So for instance, if you're doing a colon interposition, most of that stuff you can only do partially invasive. The other part you probably have to do open in a lot of settings because of what you got to address. If you have tumor that's invading structures like the um, aorta or thing that you may have to uh, consider uh, reconstructing, you know, those things are safer to, uh, to address in an open fashion. But I would say most cases you can do in a minimum invasive fashion one way or another. Carol, this uh, next question is for you. Um, I, um, you had talked, I think, about uh, using uh, some uh, sugar, sugar substitutes uh, in certain cases uh, for certain patients. And uh, a member of the audience points out that there have been concerns about cancer risk with some of these agents. And um, are you not worried about this? Do you feel that the benefit outweighs the risk? What, are, what is your response? I traditionally. Specifically aspartame. Yeah. And yeah. I think, so yeah. I, um, the, the risk is very low. You would have to really consume a lot of, a lot of these sub sugar substitutes for there to actually be an issue. It would be inhuman, the amount you would have to actually consume. That being said, there are other issues surrounding 
sugar substitutes that I don't like, be, one being gastrointestinal distress, um, even for the ones that are technically supposed to be well tolerated, like sucralose. So I try to counsel people around um, other ways that they can sweeten foods or naturally sweeten foods instead of using sugar substitutes. So um, really, I just put that information on there as you know, it, it is something that would be okay in small amounts. Okay. Um, then, of course, we have a, some, a fan of Dr. Wee's who would very much like to have a link to Dr. Wee's videos. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I, I suspect you probably have it on your Brigham website or something similar, perhaps? Uh, you have we, a webcast? Yeah, I mean, we, we do have a site at the Brigham, which is undergoing construction, actually, but uh, it's uh, multimedia. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to provide them, and you can put them on Yeah, I mean, maybe you go up to Dr. Wee and ask him. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would offer to, to show these videos during lunch, but I think that probably <laughs> it's not the most appetizing thing uh, to do while you eat your sandwiches. So, so I, again, I think you should, uh, should ask Dr. Wee directly. Um, and the last question I have is a question I think that was ans a question uh, that was uh, um, um, issued earlier and uh, again now is written down. And, and I think that we could probably answer this to a certain degree. The question is when a patient with stomach cancer metastasized to lymph nodes, pancreas, and liver gets symptoms of sweating, heart palpitations, faintness, and weakness after eating. What is the cause of these symptoms? And what types of foods to eat and avoid um, and uh, to prevent these panic attack-like symptoms? And I would say that these, these symptoms are probably most consistent with a low blood sugar. Um, and a low blood sugar typically would cause an adrenaline rush that causes some of these symptoms. Uh, so I think that one probably should look into blood sugar levels uh, in a patient who's experiencing those symptoms. They occur only after, immediately after eating. Yeah. So does that imply that the blood sugar is too low before eating? So I'm not sure exactly how that would occur, but the symptoms are most consistent with some sort of um, a manipulation of blood sugars. Uh, it could also somehow be some sort of a nerve uh, that somehow uh, nerves uh, get activated. Uh, John, well, you see it's similar symptoms fairly fairly frequently. Uh, uh, I mean, you although can... they're typically a you know, post dumping syndrome. Right. Um, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, they sound like you know dumping related um, insulin surges. You know, you can you can get uh, it's easy to get you know um, pinprick uh, blood sugar level sticks, and you can you can test it out before meals, during meals, and after meals, and see where where it stands. And some of these patients have dramatic you know, decrease in blood sugars, you know, down to the 30s and 40s and, and can have dramatic uh, effects where they're, you know, sweating and palpating and uh, there's palpitations and such. So you can make that diagnosis. I mean, you can sometimes modify it with diet adjustments with nutritionists and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. But sometimes there are difficult uh, problems to fix. There's no surgical fix uh, for it. How is it tested? Well, I think, you know, it's sometimes a trial and error, and I would recommend that um, we, for instance, at our, inst at, uh, at, our, in our, at our institute at the Brigham, we have a gastroenterologist who specializes in these post-surgical problems. Um, his name is Walter Chan, um, and uh, he basically uh, would probably initiate a workup to, to investigate these issues. So, uh, and you can find him at the Brigham and Women's Hospital website. He's a gastroenterologist. So uh, does, uh, we're coming, I think the food is here. Uh, at least they were carting in uh, various things, although I, I only see cookies and, uh, and other <laughs> unhealthy foods. Uh, so uh, again, this is of course the, the new anti-gastric cancer diet uh, that we're offering you. Um, but uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, this is for you. Carol, this is for you. As far as the foods, we have all those foods when there's some queasiness and nausea. Mm -hmm. The problem is the foods that are desired are foods that you would never think to eat when you're nauseous. Mm -hmm. So, have can you, I say it? Have you tried them? He insists on having Chef Boyardee ravioli. <laughs> <laughs> I love that stuff. <laughs> Which, this is being broadcast globally, so. 
<laughs> but it seems that it's pretty counterintuitive to those foods that actually help with nausea because there is a lot of weight loss and it's not going so well. Go for it. If Have you tried it? Maybe try half a cup the first time if you're nervous that it's going to make nausea worse. No, he eats the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fine by me. I would say that my concern with, with tomato-based, people don't realize how acid tomatoes are, uh, and that often can be a problem, particularly for people who have gastritis, esophagitis, or even some inflammation of the rectum. It can cause a lot of pain. Um, here you go. I also enjoyed the nutritional uh, discussion this morning. Thank you. Uh, could you point out, I mean, I didn't know about turmeric and that, the type of, uh, are there other spices or other common pieces that people cook with? So just to know about that, that we should so know about? There's no problem cooking with turmeric or any oh, of the okay. other spices. Um, it's just when taken in supplement form, this, the dose for turmeric for, um, most capsules is you know two thousand milligram or two thousand milligrams, yeah, compared to what you might cook with is is a lot less. Other common health additives, just so I'm just trying to There's pass so this many. on. To, to, use oh, so the, many. Use yeah, use the Memorial Sloan Kettering about herbs. You can type in any supplement or herb question that you might have, and it'll come up with a clinical Thank summary. You. Yeah, that's very helpful. I saw a question over here. Hi, thank you all. This has uh, been really an amazing morning. I appreciate the, uh, all the effort you've put into it. Um, going back to this Chef Boyardee thing, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is actually quite serious in that um, there are these cravings that, um, should I rely on them? I mean, it's peculiar. I mean, my taste buds have changed uh, from the chemo, um, sort of the acid reflex I'd never had before, all of a sudden I have it. Um, and I end up with these cravings and sometimes there are the foods that are not recommended. How much should I rely on the cravings and sort of just eat what I want to eat? And how much should I go to a prescribed diet? I wouldn't, I wouldn't follow a prescribed blanket diet. Um, if you can work with someone, I think that's the best. I'm having a lot of trouble forming blanket answers sitting up here because I really like to get to know people before I give specific recommendations. Um, if you do have esophagitis and you're craving lemonade, don't do it. I mean, that would be the, the most obvious, um, you know, hard stops. But um, I'm happy to talk with you offline, too, about the cravings. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. As a general rule, this is for Carol, I guess, specifically, would you advocate an alkaline diet, like the acid alkaline in... Um, absolutely not. Um, so this diet doesn't really have any evidence behind it in science. Um, the diet is based on the idea that cancer grows in an acidic environment and that you can actually eat foods that will make your blood more alkaline. Um, and this, this just isn't true. Our body has a really smart way of making sure our blood pH stays within a certain narrow range. So I do like the fact that the alkaline diet encourages a lot of plant foods, but other than that, it's, it's kind of a hogwash of a diet. So, but that's, well, Tell that's us what you really think. That I, yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me, uh, there's another question up here. Yeah. Is there any research evidence <clears throat> that indicates an advantage uh, to eliminate su all sugar with a patient? Who has cancer? Um, no, not yet. Um, I know it's kind of all over the place in the internet and social media that sugar feeds cancer, and it's just not that simple. I think all of these very intelligent people who have spent their lives studying cancer would love that for, for that to be true. Um, but I think there is an advantage um, post-surgically to avoiding sugar, especially if we're talking about dumping syndrome, um, and then it isn't new information either to eat a diet that's lower in sugar and refined carbohydrates, I guess, either, so. Okay. Okay. So. 
is anecdotal, but um, I think studied a little bit. Uh, just before chemo, a very low calorie um, day, one day before is seeming to have efficacy. Is that, does anybody have any opinions on that for chemo? Yes. Um, actually, some of the more recent research shows that that could actually be helpful if that's something that you're able to do and then able to make up the calorie deficit on the other side. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the sandwiches are here, and um, we're um, eager for you to dig in, although I would like to make one comment. Uh, certain uh, persons ordered gluten-free, kosher, and other specialty diets. These are labeled, and please, if you did not sign up for this, please don't take those sandwiches. Um, and otherwise, uh, please uh, feel free to dig in. As I said before, the, uh, the restrooms are through the adult glass doors. You'll immediately see the men's restroom, but the ladies' restroom is right next to this. So we're now going to take approximately a 30-minute break, and then we'll resume uh, with our talks. Uh, and again, thank you to our morning speakers. Uh, very interesting, and uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.